Welcome to the Stare Ladies Podcast, where our mission is to get more people that look like us participating in the real estate industry. Whether you're a seasoned real estate pro or just starting out, there's something for everyone here. I'm Anita Wong. And I'm Tiffany Lee. We invite experts to not just talk about real estate, but also about our unique identity as Asian women and the cultural values that shape who we are as investors. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, Pasquarters, welcome back to another episode of the Stare Ladies Podcast. I am your co-host, Anita Wong, and I am finally back with my pod wife, Tiffany Lee, who has graciously held down the fort while I was on maternity leave. Yes, we're reunited and it feels so good. And we're uh, jumping back into the swing of things with our exciting guests uh, joining us today. Oh, by the way, um, speaking of maternity leave, our background is courtesy of uh, Anita's new baby. She kind of designed this <laughs> with her uh, explosive diaper. <laughs> it's a Jackson Pollock. A Jackson Pollock. So I artistic. love it though. Yeah, just like her mommy, so artistic. Um, <laughs> So we're jumping back into the swing of things with our exciting guests joining us today, who are moms themselves. We were talking about this right before we started, um, and they all had them in close proximity. So tip to anyone thinking it's easier later on uh, as we've gleaned. See, this is me going on tangents again. So chatting with us are high school buddies turned business partners, Lila Kaplan and Rena Park, who came up in the Wall Street and tech worlds, respectively, and have pivoted their careers into a female powerhouse team called Front Door Investing, which specializes in multifamily and medical office investments. Lila Kaplan is a former, uh, let me start that over. Lila Kaplan is a former financial expert who spent 15 years on Wall Street, where her focus was on relationship management and business development for a large financial institution. Lila ventured into real estate over a decade ago, specializing in multifamily investments because as she puts it, she wants to retire her husband. She now excels as a licensed agent at Elite Home Partners at Keller Williams Integrity out in Colorado. By the way, we've got three different time zones on this call. We've got Mountain Time with Lila, mm-hmm. Pacific Time with Rena and Anita, and Easter Time with Tiffany here on the East Coast. So we got New York, Cali, and Colorado in the house. We're uh, just missing Central. We are. <laughs> <laughs> so... Off to the West Coast, Rena Park has 20 years of corporate experience in financial planning and analysis spanning across multiple industries. She has built and led finance and strategy teams at Google, Robinhood, and Warner Warner Brothers, and is now currently the lead underwriter and general partner at her and Lila's company, Front Door Investing. Some more info about Front Door Investing. Front Door Investing is a real estate group founded by women that stands out for its inclusivity, welcoming investors of all levels while understanding the unique needs of women investors. With 35 years of collective finance experience, they maintain a strong focus on technical ability and data-driven decision-making. By prioritizing risk management and transparent communication, Front Door Investing maximizes returns for for their clients while fostering trust and accountability. If you want to learn more about them, go to frontdoorinvesting.com and sign up today to stay in touch. You can also send them an email directly at lila at frontdoorinvesting.com or rena at frontdoorinvesting.com. Both Lila and Rena come from male-dominated industries in finance and tech, which is something I think we all share here. So without further ado, let's get into unpacking all of that together. First off, uh, I love that you guys are, you gals, are high school friends who've turned into business partners. A lot of people say that you shouldn't mix friends with business, but I love the story about how you both met because it's so intrinsically strategic (laughs) at its core, and you want that in your business partner, right? So which one of you wants to tell this story? It should definitely be for me. (laughs) <laughs> Rena, take it away. I will take it. So, um, so Lila and I, we actually met. Um, so she's a little older than me, um, but we met my freshman year of high school. Um, and um, basically, let's just say, like, I was the bookworm and the nerd, and Lila was a little bit more street savvy, if you will. And I was always <laughs> so intimidated by her. Um, but we had mutual friends, um, so I knew of her. I just had never talked to her before. So one day I get home from school and she calls me on my house line back when there were house lines. And she was like, <laughs> um, I need your help because there's a girl that's been leaving voicemails on my then boyfriend's um, 
voicemail and I need to know what she's saying because it sounds really sus. And so I was like, okay. And naturally I was like the only Korean that she knew because we grew up in Maryland, which, you know, there weren't a ton of Asians at the time. So, um, so then she three weighed in the voicemail and she made me translate what this girl was saying um, on his voicemails. So that's kind of how after that point, I think, you know, once once you get into like all the the boyfriend drama and, and what have you, like, you just naturally become friends. So that, that's kind of how we started. Y'all were into K-drama before K-drama was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. So did you guys grow closer after that? Like when did you guys, did you guys like keep in touch and, and that's why you decided to, you know, eventually yeah. like, get into your careers? I think we were always pretty close, but at a distance because I lived all over the place. I know Rena moved from the East coast to the West coast. So, you know, even if we fall out for a couple months or even a couple of years, once we pick up, it's just like old times. So, um, you know, it's nice. And I used to travel to California for client meetings all the time. So every time I went, I would call Rena up and we would go out and, you know, hang out and catch up just like old times. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, she, she took me out to fancy restaurants all the time. And um, yeah, and it was always nice catching up and trying to figure out where we left off. So, yeah. Aww. That's yeah. like me and Anita after she arrived. I mean, came back from her pregnancy bubble. <laughs> I'm not taking you out to fancy restaurants. Too. Uh, well, uh, that's true. <laughs> no, you guys haven't heard this, or she'll take me to weird K spas where. Oh wait, you guys are Korean, so you know all about the. the I'm Korean. Yeah, you guys, you know, you guys know each other in a new dimension. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, I was did shocked. not know that you had to be nude. And I forgot about it. And we hadn't met each other yet at that time. But I was like, <laughs> we're going to meet each other now, I guess. <laughs> it's our first time meeting each other. We're like, let's go to a Korean spot. I'm like, oh, we really know each other now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so body level. <laughs> it's very Who knew intimate. Tiffany would be such a prude? She would I, not strip in front of me. <laughs> you, know, you, know, full, you know, the scrub, the full body yes. scrub. That's it's worth it. <laughs> I love it. I love going to case spot. I'm all about being naked, ladies. I love this talk already. This is exactly <laughs> our brand. We just, we just we just go off of real estate investing. We're just like, also, yeah. I like nudity. Yeah, and then we, have, we have weekly meetings in like a spa. You know? Do you really? That would be hilarious if you guys had your like team meetings at a K spa and you're just like all lounging at the pool and you're like, everyone, this is a free brainstorm. Just like let loose and just tell your deepest thoughts and ideas. This is how you write off your spa. You know, your spa. <laughs> That's, true. That's, so, that's so true. No, I was in Vegas <laughs> and I was like, okay, we're having our weekly meetings, just the three of us. So, you know, we were on video and then I locked it <laughs> and did not realize that our third partner, Sarah's husband, was. <laughs> this conversation is taking a hard left right now. So I love it. <laughs> Can you cut that one out? <laughs> we didn't, you didn't say anything too bad. It's fine. I, I think I did worse. But yeah, Case Buzz, they have food there too. So you could just sit and dine and like eat and have an actual meeting in like yeah. the uh, cult clothes that they make you wear. Just yeah. like everyone's yeah. just the same. <laughs> All right, well, let's let's get back on track because uh, we, we took a left turn there, as Reno said. So what was your experience as a professional woman navigating each of your respective male-dominated fields in finance and tech? Like, what what lessons have you gleaned from that? And have, has that, how has that carried over into your new roles and identities as real estate investors working yeah. for yourself? Yeah, thanks for that question. So, I mean, I guess for my experience being on real uh, real estate, Wall Street, for 15 years. I was in New York uh, for a while, then Sakonis in Singapore. But I would say, for me, my experience as always, because I was in business development and also relationship management has kind of a, it has this transition. Um, as a relationship manager, I definitely see a lot more women in that role. Um, but as I transition to business development, you definitely see a lot less. And so for me, I just feel like, you know, women always feel like they need to be perfect to do the next step for them. Right. Um, and we don't advocate for ourselves very well. Um, you know, we are timid and shy in terms of 
you know, complimenting ourselves. And so for me, you know, I don't know if it's because I'm an only child, you know, I was raised by a very, you know, a, a mom, but also a, a dad that's very outspoken. Um, but I've always been very outspoken, but never as much as I, I was when I joined Wall Street. So I didn't really talk about myself. You really have to have thick skin, right? When you're on Wall Street. Um, so I kind of developed myself over the years being the only woman at the seat because men will talk over you. And if you need to get your point across, you need to learn how to maybe talk a little louder, maybe, you know, get to the point, maybe just start advocating and self-promoting yourself. So that's kind of my thing. Um, and I feel like that translates into real estate as I am, you know, um, tasked to do capital raising, right? I have to talk about our products and services. And so it's really talk about, you know, how we can help our investors, also our tenants to, um, you know, live a better life or gain better returns. So Lila, you said something interesting where it's like, you're, you're not used to bragging about yourself and, yeah. and, you know, speaking up, do you think that there's some intersection with that, with being an Asian woman as well, because we're taught to be humble and the humility piece of yeah. it like, socially conditioned that way? I, I think so. Definitely. Um, I don't know, like for me, my dad has always told me to be more outspoken. So I came from a more, I feel like my family was a little bit more liberal from an Asian perspective. Um, so I was always very outgoing, a risk taker. I talk a lot about myself, my family, um, but it's how you do it right in the industry that can promote you. Um, but I definitely agree. Like, I don't see a lot of Asian women at the table at all. Do you find that like your delivery of how you explain information has to be different? Like you kind of have to do a little bit of like verbal gymnastics that, you know, men can easily get away with being blunt, but as a woman, you kind of have to massage it in a yes. certain way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cause the way that you deliver the way that men would deliver it, you are a, you know, B-I-T-C-H. Can I say yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> I was about to just say the word for you. Like, you come off. You're, <laughs> bitch. you're too bossy. Um, you don't know what you're talking about. I could say the same thing, right? Um, as another guy, but it just, you're right. The delivery has to be you still in some form. Yeah, you have to have a soft landing and take care of everyone's feelings and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's the thing. Right? Like, yeah. My boss always said, Lila, you need to learn your soft skills. Because I'm a very blunt person. I am very blunt. But he's always said to me that you need to learn your soft skills. So that's one thing that I've been trying to improve on is my soft skills. And, you know, I'm working at it every single day. As I say, do you think men ever get that note? Like, oh, you need to work on your soft skills and your delivery of things. I don't know. None of us, none of us have been men, right? So I don't know if they ever get that note. That's true. I never thought about right. that. Yeah. <laughs> we should have a guy on the podcast and be like, did everyone, did anyone ever tell you that you should be more gentle about the way you say things to people? Because it's very jarring. <laughs> Like, well, know. I will say, I, can, I say that to my husband <laughs> pretty bluntly. I'm like, your tone and delivery could be worked on, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, could be a little bit less diggish about it, <laughs> you know, by the way. But, you know, they don't think about, or they don't, they're not told this unless maybe like their partners are like holding a mirror up in their face about how they really do come off. I'm like, honestly, if I was like, you know, someone working for you, I would, I would take that pretty harshly. So I would you know, maybe think about your tone. <laughs> At least that's what I say to my husband. That's pretty cute. Regularly. Cause I've, I've spoken with Anita's husband, Will, um, on, on like marketing. So he's like a marketing guru. And Anita gave me a note before she talked to him. She's like, he's great as a husband, but he might, I don't like the way he talks to the people he works with. So just warning <laughs> when you talk to him, he's not really like that. <laughs> Did I say that? I don't know. I think anyway. Was like a year ago. Anyway, uh, Rena, let's kick the question over to you. Um, have you gleaned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I've also worked in very male dominated industries for sure, having been in tech and also in entertainment. Um, and I feel like 
for me, one of my biggest struggles in the corporate world was really just like the imposter syndrome that I felt that I had to battle. And I think, you know, having worked with some of like the top of the top people at, you know, like prestigious companies, like you, it's really easy to start believing like you don't belong in that room. Um, and women in particular are like much more, I would say apt to feel like, they get in their own way because they get in their head a lot. Um, and I think like what has really helped me is I know there's like this whole thing of like fake it till you make it. And I know that was kind of like a mantra, but I think it's less about faking it and more about like looking back on your track record of successes that brought you to that point to like get you hired into that role or get you to, you know, be at a certain level. Um, and then reminding yourself, like, no, this isn't by chance that this happened. Like, there was a reason why I was placed in this seat. Um, and so I think that's really helped carry me in moments where I felt any form of, like, self-doubt or anything that, you know, like, that there is a lot that I can bring to the table, too. So for me, I think it was more, like, intrinsic. But it, again, it does manifest in the way that you portray yourself more confidently and the way that people take you more seriously, especially in male-dominated um, conversations, like it tends to be very, like, if there's any cracks in the cement, like they'll, they'll look for that, you know, and women tend to be used, you know, for example, like I struggle with like language that waters down my position. Right. And so you have to start kind of like training yourself to think about those things in, in conversations. If there's more men around the table, like that will show more weakness. And so like, you just, in a way, like it sucks because you're having to kind of mask or like grow into things that are what are conditioned common norms for maybe something that's more intrinsically a male trait. But I think over time, you just um, also like with some of those things, you are starting to believe in yourself more, right? The language that you use projects onto kind of how you see yourself. So I, I don't think it's necessarily all bad, but I do think women have to work a little bit harder at it because a lot of the learned norms are very different. So yeah. So do you feel like, I feel like I'm just giving leading questions just like, <laughs> like the way I'm framing the questions is like working with men totally suck, right? Like I, I feel better. I realize that I'm kind of going in the direction, but do you feel like, um, you know, working with men, like sometimes they'll undercut your achievements and kind of diminish you in a bit. Like when you were working corporate, did you guys ever experience that? Cause I have. <laughs> I think like, I would say what's harder for me is developing the actions that reward success because the dimensions that reward success are self-advocacy, are overconfidence, are like like some of those natural attributes that maybe like for males, and I'm, I'm making broad generalizations, but like males are grown, like they're kind of trained in a way or maybe intrinsically have that in them. Whereas for women, like I, I mean, I feel like it requires a little bit of additional thought and effort and training to overcome the things that are already kind of there. And there's been a lot of studies that say like women feel the need to be 100% self-assured in what they're talking about to like get up and raise their hand to do things, to apply for that job where they're not, they don't meet 100% of the requirements. And so like knowing that requires you to be, to think, to do that extra step. And I think that's what holds a lot of women back when it comes to making the decisions for things like promotion, for things like getting, you know, getting the deal, like, you know, and so I think that's where it is like that extra thing that women have to think about that maybe men don't. Those are great answers from both of you. I love it. <laughs> I think that echoes because I feel like a lot of the time, since we've been doing Sarah Ladies for a few years now, I think mm -hmm. one of the biggest thing that we battle with the women that do come to us is like they want to be Really, like they want to be a hundred percent, a hundred and ten percent sure in the deal before they jump in, and and a lot of times they don't because they don't feel a hundred percent, you know, confident in it. And then by that time, it's already the deal's already gone, right? right. The deal's already gone, um, because you know it's really hard to be like, is this property good enough? Is this market good enough? Um, and and I think a lot of it is like building that confidence of of repair and bounce back right it's like all right this deal is gonna fuck up but then do i have it within myself to you know to fix it do i can i find the resources um do the thing and and so that i you know so that i can confidently feel like i'm gonna take this deal right so i think that's a big lesson 
that I think that is imparted in real estate that, you know, sort of transfers from, from, from like that confidence issue. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I will say to that, like just ladies out there, there's never the perfect time to invest in real estate. The time was yesterday, right? We always say how many people look back 10 years from now um, and say that they regretted buying a property 10 years ago. Right. So um, don't doubt yourselves. Yeah. And it's also like trusting your ability to adjust to changing factors. Like I feel like every day real estate is an adventure, like that there's something unexpected that always pops up. And I think, you know, women intrinsically were raised to be planners and like that, that risk assessment, like that risk aversion, I guess, is there. Like You want to know that there's, this is going to be completely safe. There's a solve for everything. Whereas, um, and that's something that we have to unlearn and is like trusting in our abilities to navigate uh, risk and things that can pop up. But I also think that like women are inherently punished if things don't work out the way that men can are allowed almost societally allowed to bounce back if, you know, things that they're involved in go south. So I think that kind of weighs into our perfectionism or and this imposter syndrome, because I, I don't know, maybe this is me in my head, like creating this dynamic that doesn't exist. But I almost I, I think that's where it comes from for me is like, if I mess up, no one, I'm not going to get another chance again, but men are just like, Oh, I'll just fire again. And, you know, just get back on the saddle. Have you right. guys experienced that as well? Like, is that, am I alone in this feeling? Um, uh, for me, that's kind of how I, am. I don't know. Like, I, I feel like I'm a man. I'm a, a, a woman <laughs> on the exterior, but sometimes a man interior. Cause that's, Honestly, that's how I handle stress, to be honest. And I talk to Rena about this all the time. I'll let myself for a split moment to feel like I'm a complete failure, that I, 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 I can't do anything, um, and let myself cry for a moment and, and then, you know, put a timer on it and just move on from it. Um, so I can, as Rena puts it, I can self-regulate pretty well. And that's just because of, you know, the demand of my job formerly on Wall Street, right? Like you can't cry about it and, and dwell on it for a very long time. You just got to move on um, and move on to the next thing. So for me, I'm a very solution based person. So I plan plan A, plan B, plan C and plan D. And if A doesn't work, I move on to B, then C, then D, right? So I have that all laid out before I do anything in my life, including, you know, buying my own property. So that's just how I regulate because I can't take stress. Like if you really saw me hitting that threshold, my God, I would have a meltdown. So I try not to hit that threshold for myself. Um, but that's just kind of how I am and, and how I regulate my stress. You know, I, would, I, would also ahead, add, I, I know we're talking about this dichotomy of taking risk and being perfect. Like I actually think Lila and I struggle with very different philosophies but I think that's what makes us like amazing business partners in a way because like with like Lila is always going to be a perpetual optimist and I think she's always the one that has like the the long-term vision set forth and I'm much more the tactical like how do we get there like what do the numbers look like do I feel confident that the numbers tell a story that is going to be meaningful like and I think you need both ends of that like you need someone who's like in the weeds, like diligent, scrubbing everything, making sure that everything is like, looks correct. And then, and then you have someone that's kind of like when, like, and, and I'm sorry to say this, but with real estate, there's always like two steps forward, one step backwards, right? It's like a yeah. series of good news, bad news. And so whenever there's bad news, Lila just like gets up and she's like, okay, we're going to solve this. And it's just like that confidence that's like so needed in those like particular moments. Um, but there's also for me, like, I think the tactical planning of like, this is how we're going to move forward. Um, and so we are as a team, like able to kind of like in certain moments, kind of like bring, bring the team forward. So I think right. that's kind of where, like, if you talk about like a, a Korean K-pop group, like everyone has like a role <laughs> in personality. Like, I think Lila is very much kind of like the, when shit hits the fan, like we're going to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and get it done. And I'm very much like the, like, I, I like know that there's like sound investment in this. I know that we've looked at risk mitigation strategies. I know that we are prepared for every outcome possible um, and convinced ourselves this is the right thing. So I think on both ends, like we just work well together. 
That was exactly the question that I was going to ask. And Rena, you organically got there. I was like, hey, how do you guys bounce off of each other? Because we've you, the three of us had had a conversation offline about how your skill sets and your personality sets complement each other and kind of, you know, fill in the, you know, where because nobody can do 100 percent of everything. But I think like sometimes when someone feels down, like it's someone's at 60%, the other person's at 40%. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it's good. It, and it's always in flux, right? But you, I, th I like that, you know, that teamwork aspect of it is like you can lean on each other, uh, you know, for, for different things that pop up. So that actually leads to the next question. So now that you guys have your all women real estate investment team that you've built from the ground up, what noticeable differences in culture have you seen in building out that team uh, so from repivoting to your old corporate careers that have influenced uh, your investment outcomes for your clients? Yeah. So I worked at Robinhood for um, some time and this was actually like one of their biggest like missions. So we talked about this all the time, um, even in kind of like a corporate setting of just like women and how their investment philosophies differ a lot from kind of like men and just the, the fact that there's a lack of women who are actively investing their wealth. Um, and I think um, there's definitely this like very, very definitive recent trend that women are taking up much more positions of power in kind of their financial journeys. Um, so there was a study that was done by Alliance Life um, and they surveyed a group of, of adult women. And what they found was that 49% of women actually consider themselves to be the CFO of their household. So it's now pretty much half and half, which um, is so different than it's been historically. And then also that women, like 43% of women also consider themselves to be the primary breadwinner um, of their family. So both of these stats are up 9% in just three years. And, and that just tells you how quickly the, the pace of this like transition is moving. Um, but again, like just qualitatively from my, my experience, Lila's experience, you can see that if you look around the conference room, like you don't see, you know, women in, in kind of like real estate investment, you don't see women in kind of like corporate leadership. And so there is still that lack of representation at the top ranks. Um, but just knowing that the bottom is moving so quickly, like that the, the investors, the people that really want to get in. Um, are are becoming more and more women dominated. Like I think we are at this like tipping point where we will start to see more women voices starting to enter the boardrooms. And I think that's really, really exciting. And what I find more exciting about that, and as a mom, like I'm just saying that like financial literacy and gender roles are things that are learned in the house. And those things are passed down from generation to generation. So I think we are very much at a point where we're going to see that women are going to take much more empowered measures to understand what it's like to build generational wealth, not just for themselves and their households, but for their kids and setting them up too. And that's why, like, I think for Lila and I, it's like super important to be able to speak the story about real estate, because there's nothing better in, in terms of like building generational wealth, tax savings, long-term kind of like goals than, and, and really building house and, and security, passive investing than real estate is. And so that's kind of like where, Lila and I are also like very much like passionate about kind of the asset class that we represent. So, yeah. And if you think about the multifamily space, you know, a lot of our tenants are single mothers, right? So I, I feel like as women, we can empathize with their lifestyle. You know, at the end of the day, all they're looking for is the safety and security of their family, right? They tend to stay in a rental property a lot longer they tend to, um, you know, keep the condition of the property, you know, much cleaner. I mean, I, so I just closed on a 360 unit property in Des Moines, Iowa, and we literally walked through 360 units of, of the apartment complex. And I'll tell you, I mean, it, when it comes to all men, my gosh, the, the place is typically trashed. And then you walk into a, a very clean you know, apartment smelling nice with some candles. Um, I always see, you know, a baby crib or some kind of kid stuff, right, in, in, in the apartment. So, like, just from a personal experience, I definitely see the difference of, you know, between men, single men, bachelor men versus mothers who, you know, needs to take care of their family. So ultimately, when you invest in a woman, 
right? They give back to the community twice or three times more um, than what a man can. And I'm not like shitting on men right now. Like we need them, right? Like in our industry, because there's a not not a lot of women in the industry, we do need men to be our allies, to be our mentors, because they're doing it right now. But it's learning about how they're investing in our field and serving their community and how we're going to do it a little differently. Um, because I think for men, they're thinking about numbers. They're thinking about ROI. They're thinking about returns to their investors versus we are thinking about those points as well. But we're also thinking about how we can, you know, um, make the community what what we can do to better our community, right? Not just from a return to investor perspective, but really return to the entire community rather than just one set of investors. So, yep, quality over quantity, which yeah. I think that compounds right long term in, in the community that you serve. Like I, I think you know, uh, if you do the right things, they say the scoreboard takes care of itself, and I think you see that in the long term appreciation when you reinvest back into the community and make yeah. it a better place to live. Yeah, yeah. I, I will also. Like Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Lila. Sorry, I was just going to say, and ultimately, if you think about it, it, it's back to, you know, it returns back to us, right? It's, it's a full cycle. Is If we can, you know, do better for the community, you know, the community will be much cleaner, much safer, and then, you know, ultimately give, give us a better return on our investment. So it's just the circle of life, as the Lion King said. <laughs> I, I will also say that on the investor side, right, like as women and as, for me, especially being a woman that, you know, really values um, like measured risk, right? Um, I, I'm in finance, so I am like probably one of the most risk adverse people out there. But I think as a lead underwriter, that plays a very big role. And also knowing like what, as a woman investor myself, what makes me comfortable with an investment. And that re might require a lot more due diligence. That might require a lot more education about the transaction, about the condition of the property, about the numbers that that like um, that we've used to underwrite a deal. Those are all things where, you know, there are a lot of, you know, investment groups where they require a very high minimum threshold and they, you know, just kind of like run through like very, very high level numbers that perhaps beginning investors don't understand. And I think what makes our group different is, you know, we have a very open door policy about these things of wanting to be able to kind of like make women investors that don't feel like they have enough information, feel comfortable about um, approaching an investment and feeling like they're able to like fully understand it. I love that. And I, um, and I love that it's, uh, there's so many points to just like just this past 10 minutes. I feel like, <laughs> You know, I, I as someone that went to business school, I feel like I went to I, I've seen a lot of those hockey stick charts, you know, and I, you know, I think it's just like everything is like, you know, it's like goes up, goes up, you know, high risk and high reward. Um, and that made me as a, you know, as a female investor, pretty skeptical. The more the more hockey sticks, like the more hockey stick charts that I saw, the more that I was like, are you sure? You know, and so I love that it's sort of like now that women are kind of taking more of a helm that they're kind of um keeping those hockey stick trends in, ch in check people that are you know producing those uh those charts like people keeping them in check um and i also kind of see that in our female investors too that they're like they want to know more they want to understand realistically what it is they're not they're more hesitant and more um i guess like steady-handed and wanting to see like okay well they're they're interested in taking less risk and less reward, but it seems more of a reality. Do you kind of see more of that in your investors these days, uh, Rena and Lila? I think uh, in this, oh, go ahead. No, Rina. go ahead. I, I think in this market, everyone should take caution because yeah. a lot of the things that were historical assumptions no longer are the case, right? And so, and, and with every, any investment, whether it's real estate or not, like no return is ever guaranteed. What you're assessing is like, what's the amount of risk that I'm putting in and what's the potential reward? And if any of those factors that go into the underwriting change, like what is the downside potential, right? That's the way that I think as an underwriter and that's how every investor should think. Um, and in this economy, 
you can't take the sum of averages and just like plug it in and expect that to continue, right? We're in a transitionary state in the economy. And so like a lot of the questions that women investors are asking are the right ones. And I think that we should have the patience and understanding to allow every investor the ability to look at the numbers, understand what level of risk that we've baked in, what things, what are the things that are most concerning, what are the sensitivity charts of if those things go wrong, and allow everyone to make a decision for themselves of what works and doesn't work. And so I do think it's there's a lot of value in explaining to people like this is not like a I plug in a number into a model and then here's your return. And like we all guarantee that return. Like that's not how investing works. It's about saying what are the things that could go really south, right? And like, what would happen for me and my family if I wasn't able to get that return, right? Like these are, the, and these are personal questions. And so I think that's kind of why, you know, we don't see investing as a transactional thing. We see it as like a holistic, what works for your family? What's the level of risk you're willing to take on? And what's the amount of money that you're willing to see upside potential or lose? And that's, that, that's just the game. And there's always going to be upside, right? Like the other thing to mention is, Investing is all about time and market. So like the longer you're in it, the chances of you making a much better return that compounds on itself is great. And there's a yeah. lot of women who are sitting on the sidelines and they're like, I'm going to wait it out. Mm. Um, and I think there are times where you have to time the market. But a lot of times, as Lila mentioned, not being in the market for five years because you're still trying to figure it out. Chances are you've already lost like a pretty big chunk of like what you could have gotten, even if it went down in the beginning. So I do think, you know, like, again, like it's all about education. Lila and I are very, very passionate about like, you know, encouraging women to do their research. We never want to detract from women doing their research because I think that's the right thing to do right. um, and, and making a personal decision for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I think women you know have a have Sorry, a harder yeah. time no the women have a harder time i think they they know inherently to do the research but they have a harder time to just just take Hold the jump yes yes, yes. Sure. and i think that's where community is such an important part of it because you need to like communities like these to just be like girl you got it just take the jump even if you fail like that you have your own back right yeah yeah and again time right you you lose you lose two bets, you like Tiff Tiffany, you're you're in poker, right? Like you lose two bets, but then you win 10 bets. And then over time, those like eight bets that compound, and then now like, you know, you're you're still like you don't have to be perfect on every bet, but what we want to do is minimize the risk of anything that can be avoidable, right? Like what are the things that can be avoidable? What are the things that can be disclosed? All those things are really important in kind of like determining the right route for your investments. Yeah. Yeah. You want to make more better decisions than bad decisions. You minimize your loss, maximize your, your, your gains. Right. And, and that comes down to like making more good decisions because you're going to make bad decisions here and there, but for the most part, you want to make good decisions because real estate, like poker, it's a long term thing. It, you're going to lose sometimes in the short term, but if you continually make good decisions in the long term, you'll ride out those little swings. It's like looking at the stock market. It, it goes like this and then it goes up. Lose the battles and win the yeah. war. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but I would also say that, you know, it's also coming from a resource perspective, right? So, you know, if there's more women investors like ourselves in the multifamily, in the larger, big, you know, larger deals, if you're looking at the smaller deals, the fix and flips, you know, the smaller single family buy and hold, there's tons of women who's investing at that scale. But the only reason that we are scaling up and we are taking this huge risk on our business it's because we know the benefits and we're doing it for our families, right? That's that's our ultimate goal here. And to be in that space, to scale up to the 50, 100, 200, 300 units, you just don't see a lot of women up there. So it's having that resources, it's having people like us being a resource for anybody who wants to get into that space. That's the, that's the component that's lacking. Um, because when I was invited to the syndicate team, um, the 360, it's, you know, it's an all men team, but a, a, a very gracious, generous team lead um, took me on because he saw the need for some diversity on his team. So there's five men and one of me. Um, but, you know, like when we're jumping on these meetings, I'm the one that's asking all the questions. I'm the one that's talking. Um, and I don't really hear the other GP really saying much. So I just want to learn as much as I can from these successful multifamily investors or whatever investors, right? 
and then leverage that, convert it into something that now I can translate it to women um, who also want to kind of climb this whatever real estate ladder <laughs> to get to where they want to be so that they can build financial wealth for their families. Yeah, I, I think that that is a core philosophy that we have at Sarah Ladies is sort of like how much of um, representation really matters. I think Tiffany talked about this previously, that there's so much representation for women in the real estate agent world. There's so much in the fix and flipper world, like the Joanna yeah. Gaines doing the interior design kind of stuff. So we see more women in that space, but there aren't that many women in the CRE space, right? And so that's why we have at Sarah Lee has been really intentional about bringing women like you to be like, I, like we want to see more female teams that are doing big deals um, yes. because there just isn't representation here, right? And representation is so important, even though it doesn't necessarily lead to liberation, but I think it certainly is extremely important to kind of look at the person next to you and have them look like you and kind of feel like you are part of the same team and part of the same club going through the same things. Um, and that's so important when, especially when you're, you know, like you can, like women can believe in themselves and we have worked really hard. And we are really resilient, but it's not an all the time thing. We can't just, we can't be a hundred percent all the time. And so I think, uh, you know, seeing um, camaraderie and community and people that look like you in the space you want to be is so important. And we need to learn how to dream a little bigger, ladies. Dream big. You know, I talk about I talk about how we want to make a hundred thousand dollars a month in passive income, and everyone laughs and freaks out. Why not? You can do it. Just dream bigger. High rollers. That's what we call in poker. The super <laughs> high rollers. You don't want to be grinding those small stakes forever. No. Um, you want to scale up. And in order to do that, you have to team up with other people. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Partners. Yes. I, I think that's huge, right? Because every real estate transaction that happens, you're never doing it in a vacuum. You're never doing it alone. You have a very extensive, extensive partner network and investor network that backs every deal. And as kind of like the GPs on any deal, you have to basically move worlds of those people to all kind of like culminate in one single transaction and moment. And so it requires a lot of influence and it requires a lot of trust. And when most of the partners in the industry right now, like, I mean, Lila and I will tell you, we've been on so many calls and 90% of the calls that we have are pretty much like male because they're the ones that are you know, in the space today. And so um, I think the more, you know, teams that you see like Lila and I, we're just, you know, we might be rare today, but, you know, hopefully we'll be see seeing more and more women in commercial real estate. like. I think that, you know, the partnership models might start to feel a little different, look a little different. And those 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 bonds and of trust are going to become easier. But like in the beginning, it's I think it's always a little bit harder. Right. Because yeah. all the things that we talked about. Um, and so I do, but I do think commercial real estate, you know, there's ebbs and flows, but there's different types of commercial real estate. And I think overall, like we're positioning ourselves in what will be a very good strategic moment for people to invest, right? I think we all kind of like know that that time is coming um, in this market transition. And like, I just think like being able to network, form those bonds, meet people that are like-minded. And um, what we found is women are the most hungry, right? Like, I mean, we, we say that they're, we're risk adverse, but also like we're the ones that are, no, we have to work, you know, very hard to get our foot in the door because we're still proving ourselves. And I think um, that's okay. Um, we have a lot to offer. We have a lot to give. And there, there's a whole host of women investors, as I mentioned, that are entering the market now and wanting to learn more and know more and wanting to bring their assets. So so I'm encouraged by this. Um, I'm excited about it. Um, and, and I think now is the time, the right time in the market. I think it's the right time for women in real estate. Um, but yeah, like I am glad you guys are doing things like this to kind of create that sisterhood and that community where we can intersect with other like-minded women. Um, who have a shared experience. So and Asian yeah. women. Yes, I know. And I and I think that we've come a long way too because like uh, Tiffany and I started this journey in uh 2021. Was it yeah. three years oh now? Oh my god. Yeah. Like 
Ooh. Yeah, and this was like you know at the at the peak of API hate crimes, you know, sort of like and coming from the Donald Trump uh, presidency and all that drama, which we're heading back into again. <laughs> and so I think it's like we, we are having definitely a different conversation now in 2024 than we were back then. And I, I love that you were bringing up statistics earlier, Rena, because I think that there are some that we want to I, I want to highlight today because. When we first started, there were, I think, 11% of women that were identifying themselves as as investors. And now we are, at, you know, we're, we're making gains, right? You know, 30% of active property investors are women. Um, and then US, in the U.S., single women are outpacing single men in home ownership, right? So whatever we're doing, I think it's working, which is nice because we've made some, you know, I think the perspective on, on women investing um, – is is different than it was back then um and uh, and i want to look forward you know in 2025 that it'll continue to grow and i guess my question to you guys is like where um i i think that those uh like new perspective of like bringing women to the table and giving them a voice, not stepping over their conversation. Those have been really great tools and tactics to kind of identify like more women in the, in, in the room. Right. So where do you kind of see us going to 2025? What are some tools and tactics to help us continue to grow um, in the future years? Yeah. I, I think it's just being outspoken, right? Like if you have found success, the way that you give back is you talk about it. And so one of my my goals is to be on as many podcasts as possible. I want to be in as many conferences as possible to share my success, but also my failures. You know, like my first deal, I lost $50,000. Um, and how do we learn from this mistake, right? Um, you know, ultimately, I want to get on the bigger pockets conference and be a speaker. Um, I, I, just, I, I feel like we have a lot of share, a lot to share, and not only as women, but also Asian women as well. Again, you know, you might see some women, but not a lot of Asian women in this space. Um, I know Vina Jetty is definitely, you know, one to be noted and and has been on this very successful journey and has been sharing her, um, you know, systems and operations and everything else, but there should be more. Right. Um, and so I hope that one day as I gain more momentum with front door investing and with this team that we can get on the stage and really share why we started this journey, why we're passionate about it. And, you know, sharing the failures and the success with anybody. And I always said this, like, I know everybody does like educational courses and they sell this. I'm more than happy to do anything pro bono and share my experiences pro bono because I think we need it as women. I want to see more women in this because you know why? Because I want more partners that can think like us, right? That can invest like us. Because I'll tell you right now, I'm putting it on this podcast, the, the next couple of deals that we're going to pick up is going to be from men who have failed in the last couple of years. And we're going to pick up all of their investments <laughs> and produce great returns for our investors. So that's where we are. I love that. And we're actually coming up on time. So we're going to jump into our rapid fire questions I met. Yes. Yay. Love it. Okay. All right. So uh, we're just going to do rapid fire questions. Uh, and I'm going to go Rena first and then Lila. Okay. okay. So what is one thing a mentor or family member taught you that still resonates with you today? Um, because I'm a perfectionist, I would say asking myself, is, is it good enough for me right now? Um, and then kind of leaving it there. Um, yes. That's mine. <laughs> Love it. Uh, my dad always said to never take shortcuts, but the way that I translated this is just to be a little bit more smarter and more efficient. I love that. I also 
<laughs> Asian background, never take the shortcuts, but yeah. also, you know, but also not do everything DIY. <laughs> also not, also maybe cut corners. That's something I had to unlearn. <laughs> no shortcuts, but cut corners. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Next question. Name someone that is doing something awesome that everyone should know. Rena. Um, so my, one of my favorite nonprofits is, um, foster the city. It's basically, um, a nonprofit that is trying to find a loving, caring home for every child that's placed into foster care so that there's never a waiting list of foster kids. Love it. Okay. Um, I would say, why not us? We are doing something amazing. Uh, we're, you know, although we're women led team, we're not women exclusive. And our goal is really for the betterment of the communities that we invest in, right? So, um, and with every, you know, every investment that we invest into, we are giving back, whether it's monetary or time. Um, so I haven't heard any other groups do this. Um, so I would say we're, we will start to change and, uh, you know, change communities. Okay, name a book that significantly changed your career, Mina. So um, I have my biggest woman crush in life is Michelle Obama. Um, Becoming yes. by Michelle Obama is my favorite book. And I love just that she's so intelligent and so like poised and so like career driven, but she's also a great mom and also a great wife. And she's willing to also play the supporting role. Like, I just love the duality of how she's, all of the things and still vulnerable. And that, that's just why I love her. So <laughs> yeah. I love her. How okay. do I top that? <laughs> <laughs> my Are book you is so book? lame, Rena. So my book right now that's actually significantly changed the way that I think is White Doctors Don't Get Rich. It's actually written by Dr. Thomas Burns. Um, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He went from becoming a doctor into a full-time uh, real estate investor. And as a matter of fact, he bought uh, Robert Kiyosaki's very first book, which was being sold at a car wash. And so he actually called. So within the, uh, the, uh, the forward, they had a phone number on the bottom. So he called the phone number. And Robert Kiyosaki actually picked up his number and now they're like best friends anyway. And the reason that is, you know, kind of influences me is because I, my husband does have a medical professional background. And so I do understand the need of doctors to build their wealth because quite often they're being poached by financial advisors early on in their life. And so now how do I transition from a stock bond uh, mutual fund portfolio into a real estate portfolio that can benefit you from even a tax saving strategy. So that's a pretty cool book to, to read. Easy read too. Awesome. Okay. Uh, what is one habit that you have in your daily routine that fundamentally changed who you are as a businesswoman? Mine is coffee. <laughs> fundamentally changed me into a better human being because if I don't have my coffee in the morning, I... I'm not. Is it, are you like a make your own your own coffee like kind of thing, or you have like a whole I have, seven part system? <laughs> I have I have waves. I I that come and go. Like sometimes I try to like get into making my own, but sometimes I just I love going into like Starbucks and just like getting the paper cup in that first sip. It just like it it's like the highlight of my day. So yeah, <laughs> nothing better than other people making your coffee. I get it. Sorry. Yeah. Like, I'm not <laughs> Found. It's literally just coffee. Um, and then maybe in the evening, some wine, but <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, Lila. So this is where we differ. Uh, I don't drink coffee. Uh, I don't do any caffeine whatsoever. Um, but I think for me is time blocking. Like if you look at my calendar, everything that I do is color coded. I have to put it on the calendar. Um, because if I don't, I'm going to forget I'm a mom of three kids under five, um, and running multiple businesses at this point. So, you know, time blocking is so important to me. So if you're not on my calendar, I have no idea <laughs> like what we're supposed <laughs> to do. 
Thanks for putting us on your calendar, Lila. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you put yourself on the calendar. I just accept it. <laughs> Well, Lila and Rena, thank you so much for joining us today on the Sarah Ladies podcast. Uh, if, again, if you guys want to learn more about Lila and Rena and get in touch with them, uh, you can go to frontdoorinvesting.com, uh, sign up to stay in touch. You can also send them an email directly at Lila, L-I-L-A, at frontdoorinvesting.com. That's F-R-O-N-T-D-O-O-R-I-N-V-E-S-T-I-N-G.com or Rena at frontdoorinvesting.com. Uh, so thanks, ladies, again, for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Thank thanks you so for much for having, having us. us. This was so Thank much you. fun. Lots and lots yeah. of fun. Thank you. And good luck, Anita, with all your sleep. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Or lack no sleep. Can you get <laughs> coffee when you breastfeed? Is that allowed? I drink coffee all the time. I don't know. I mean, I drank it also throughout my pregnancy. <laughs> it's so hard. One cup is okay. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. Doctor says it's okay. So it's fine. All right. I wonder yeah. if it changes the taste for the baby. Like it's like mocha or no. I don't think well, that's yeah. it. I don't think that's really a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank all right. You. Thanks. Ladies. Thank you. The following is an important legal disclosure regarding the content of the Sarah Ladies podcast entertainment purposes only. The content provided in all episodes of the Sarah Ladies podcast, including discussions, opinions, interviews, and any other type of content, is intended solely for entertainment purposes. It should not be considered professional, financial, legal, or any other type of advice. No professional advice. The hosts, guests, and producers of the Sarah Ladies podcast are not professional advisors. The content provided should not be relied upon for making any personal, financial, or business decisions. We strongly encourage our listeners to seek advice from qualified professionals before making any decisions based on the content of this podcast. No liability. The creators, hosts, and producers of the Sarah Ladies podcast shall not be liable for any errors or omissions in the content provided, nor for any actions taken by any listener based on the information provided in the podcast. Any reliance you place on such information is therefore strictly at your own risk. No endorsement of investments. While we may discuss a range of topics, including investments and financial strategies, such discussions are for illustrative and entertainment purposes only. The Sarah Ladies podcast does not endorse or recommend any specific investments or financial products. Consult professionals. We strongly advise our listeners to consult with a qualified professional for advice tailored to their personal circumstances before making any investment or financial decisions. No association. There is no association between Sarah Ladies and a guest speaker or professional. By listening to the Sarah Ladies podcast, you acknowledge and agree to this disclaimer and understand that the content provided is not intended to replace professional advice. Now on to the show. Thank you for tuning in to the Sarah Ladies podcast hosted by Anita Wong and Tiffany Lee. If you enjoyed our show, please leave us a review or follow Sarah Ladies on Spotify and Instagram. And also click on our show notes to subscribe to our newsletters to stay on top of our news and upcoming events. Until next time, pod squatters.